Hello everyone, it's Dr. Trussell and guess what? This is our last chapter for the semester and in chapter 11 we're looking at stockholders equity. So we finished all of the assets, we finished all of the liabilities. Now we're going to talk about the final category in the balance sheet which is stockholders equity. So when we talk about stockholders equity, several things we're going to look at in this chapter. The stockholders equity is related to the corporate form of organization and so we have to talk about issuing stock. And there's another type of um, when you buy back your own stock it's called treasury stock. Another class of stock is called preferred stock and also part of stockholders equity is dividends and retained earnings. And then what's the financial statement? How do we analyze financial statements related to re related to uh, stockholders equity. So in this book we've been talking almost exclusively about the corporate form of organization and a corporate form is an entity that's separate and distinct from its owners as opposed to say a sole proprietorship or a partnership which is not necessarily distinct from its owners. And a corporation you can classify by by purpose, which would be, for example, a nonprofit organization or a for-profit. A nonprofit organization is like a charity. And they give you a couple examples down here. Salvation Army, American Cancer Society. A for-profit company is a regular business that you're used to thinking about. They give you some examples down here, Facebook, IBM, etc. And you can also classify it by ownership, which means it's publicly held. That means that you and I can buy stock in those companies or bonds. It's the stock and bonds are made available to the public. Where privately held companies, you cannot buy the stocks and bonds and those companies are not available to the general public. So these are various characteristics of a corporation. We're going to take each one of them one at a time, but this kind of puts them all together. Talking about the corporate form, there are several characteristics that distinguish from proprietorships and partnerships. One distinguishing characteristic is a separate legal existence. The corporation acts under its own name rather than the name of its stockholders. If you think about a partnership, they're acting under the name, you know, uh, of the individual uh, partners. A corporation has limited liability. That is, you can only lose what you invest in the company. If I invest some money in IBM, I put $1,000 in there, that's the most I could lose. Where in a partnership, you can lose more than that. They can come after your other assets. It's easy to sh sell your ownership rights in this corporation, particularly a publicly traded one, where a partnership, it's not so easy to, to sell off your ownership in the company. It's also relatively easy to acquire capital because you can sell stock partnership or proprietorship there you're not selling stock really the only way to get capital is putting it investing your own personal funds or borrowing the money it also has a continuing continuing life continuous life um, in a partnership if one of the partner uh, dies or retires or quits uh, then the the partnership could be terminated with the corporation if a stockholder dies or whatever, it doesn't end the corporation, it keeps going forward. Also, there's separation of ownership and management, which prevents the owners from having an active role in managing the company. This could be a pro, it could be a con. It's a it's an advantage in that it's good, it's better for internal controls, but it's a disadvantage in that if you're uh, a partner, 
you you want to have an active role and to see how the company's going. Well, it's definitely a disadvantage the amount of government regulations compared to the partnership or proprietorship form. Corporations have lots and lots of different or, uh, regulations from different organizations. The state, the state law, the SEC, stock exchanges, federal regulations, lots of regulations. And finally, corporations pay additional taxes, more taxes than a partnership or proprietorship because the corporation itself pays taxes as a separate legal entity and the dividends are taxed to the stockholder. So they sometimes call that double taxation where partnerships, it's only taxed, the, the income is taxed at the, part, at the individual owner's level. And looking at a corporate form, the organizational chart is fairly typical where you have this, in essence, the stockholders that are the owners. Remember, if you buy stock in a company, you're the owner and you get to elect, vote for the chairman of the board and the board of directors. So the stockholders vote and then the board is the one who appoints and helps to uh, govern uh, by selecting the president, the chief executive officers, and then that president or CEO is in charge and would set up all the, the vice presidents and such. So that's a fairly typical kind of corporate form. And then the accounting aspect typically comes under this VP of finance or chief financial officer or CFO. Underneath the CFO, you would have the treasurer who's in charge of the cash, keeping charge, a track of the cash, and a controller, which is the head accountant, if you will. There are other forms of business organizations that we talked about um, that is besides corporations, partnerships, and sole proprietorships. What's nice about these other forms, these are sometimes called hybrid forms because they have uh, some of the benefits of a partnership and a corporation. And that is the limited liability partnership, limited partnership, limited liability partnerships, very, very popular form is the LLC. And then there's the S corporation or sometimes called the subchapter S or sub S corporation. And the benefit is that there's no double taxation and limited liability to whatever your investment is. So it's kind of the, both, the best of both worlds. However, there is a restriction in, on some of these forms to how many shareholders you can have. Still talking about the corporate form, what rights do the shareholders have? Well, I showed you in a previous slide that the shareholders vote for the board of the directors and some of the uh, major events that take place by a company. And they have a share of the corporate earnings. The net income belongs to the owners and those are paid through dividends. Also, you have the what's still talking about the corporate form. What rights do the shareholders have? Well, I showed you in a previous slide that the shareholders vote for the board of the directors and some of the uh, major events that take place by a company. And they have a share of the corporate earnings. The net income belongs to the owners and those are paid through dividends. Also, you have the what's so if you buy stock, well, in the old days, you would actually get a certificate that looks something like this. Now, nowadays, uh, it's all done digitally, but it's the same idea. You would have uh, some pre-numbered certificate. It would have the name of the company on it. 
it would have your the stockholder's name on it it would have the signature of the corporate official and how many shares that you bought and when they issue stock you can do it the company can issue it directly to an investor or indirectly through an investment banking firm or a stockbroker and the top five stock exchanges by by value of shares how much the shares are these is this is in the world notice that the top two are us even though we only have five percent of the world's population we have the two biggest um, stock exchanges in the world when you issue when a company issues stock there are two primary sources of equity you'll see that two primary sources what's called paid in capital and what's called retained earnings paid in capital is the total amount of cash and other assets paid into the corporation by stockholders in exchange for shares ownership so it's what the investors have invested into the company retain earnings on the other hand is the net income that a corporation retains in the company as opposed to pays out for dividends for future use in the business so you company earns net income and they can either keep it which we call retained earnings or pay it out which we call dividends Here's an illustration. Assume that Hydroslide issues 2,000 shares of $1 par value common stock. Prepare the journal entry if the 1,000 shares are issued for $1 per share or the 1,000 shares are issued for $5 per share. The par value is basically an arbitrarily stated number on the stock certificate. It doesn't mean that's what they're worth. In the first example, it is what they're worth. So the journal entry is actually fairly straightforward when you have that take your thousand shares at the one dollar sale price and you have cash coming in so we debit cash and we increase now this is stockholders equity and stockholders equity increases with a credit if you issued it at five dollars then a thousand shares times your five dollars is five thousand dollars but the common stock is still at the par so we have to create another account called paid in capital in excess of par for the other $4. So this is just your $4 per share excess of five minus one, because this is $5 per share here. And $4 we put into par value, I'm sorry, $1 par value, which means $4 times a thousand shares is what we call paid in capital in excess of par. And that paid in capital in excess of par is a stockholder's equity. This is all part of stockholder's equity. And you'll see the common stock, which is always at par value, plus your paid in capital in excess of par gives you your total paid in capital. That plus your retained earnings gives you your total stockholder's equity. ABC issues 1,000 shares of $10 par value at $12 per share. When the transaction recorded is recorded, credits are made to. Well, just remember the previous journal, the entry we did, we credit common stock at the par value and additional paid in capital for anything above the par value. So therefore, we know we're gonna have 1,000 times 10 in our common stock so we have to credit common stock for ten thousand the other two dollars which is the twelve minus two times a thousand is two thousand goes to paid in capital so therefore the answer has to be c now let's talk about accounting for treasury stock treasury stock is when a corporation's own stock that has been reacquired but not retired. So you're buying back or purchasing their own outstanding stock. So they've sold it, now they're buying it. 
Why would they do that? Well, they might have to reissue shares to officers under bonus and stock compensation plans, or they could increase the trading because that is going to reduce, uh, that is going to um, uh, increase the um, increase the market value of the stock because there is not as many shares out there, and they'll have additional shares available if they're acquiring other companies or they can increase their earnings per share. Fewer shares outstanding means a higher earnings per share. Another infrequent reason is to eliminate hostile takeovers because you are reducing the amount of shares out there to be purchased by the corporate raiders. How do we account for treasury stock? When you purchase treasury stock, it's accounted for by the cost method, which we, means we debit treasury stock for the price paid, whatever the price or the cost was. And treasury stock is a contra stockholders equity, has the opposite balance, so it's a debit balance. And treasury stock decreases by the same amount when the company later sells the shares. So on February, here's an example. This is our balance sheet before the buying the treasury stock. On February 1st, 2014, Meat acquires 4,000 shares of its stock at $8 per share. So $8 is the cost. So the journal entry is to debit treasury stock and credit cash at the cost, 4,000 times the cost of 8,000. And that treasury stock is a contra equity. So that contra equity, notice less treasury stock. So we're actually subtracting treasury stock to get our total stockholders equity. Treasury stock may be repurchased. Why would you do that? More than one of the above, because to reissue, to reissue shares to the officers and employees under the bonus, that's true, we said that. To signal the stock market, the management believes the stock is underpriced because that'll drive the price up, that's true. And if additional shares available for use in the acquisition of other companies, that's true also. Typically, preferred stockholders have a priority. No, sorry, uh, we're talking now about preferred stock. Preferred stock is a different class of stock. So we have common stock and preferred stock, two different types of stock that a company can issue. And what do we mean by preferred? What's their preference? They have preference or priority to dividends. And if the company goes under, they get their assets first, but they do not have voting rights. And so because it's a different kind of stock, we have to have two different uh, paid in capital accounts, one for preferred stock and one for common stock. Here's an example. Stein Corporation issues 10,000 shares, $10 par value preferred stock for $12. Journalized issuance preferred stock. This looks just like when we issued common stock. We debit cash. That's for the 10,000 shares times a $12 price. We credit preferred stock at the $10 par, right? $10 par. And the difference, the $2 additional, it goes to paid in capital in excess or above par for preferred stock. So preferred stock, they have dividend preferences. That means they have they get their dividends before the common shareholders do. And the dividend is stated as a percentage of this preferred stock's par value. It's called the dividend rate. And a cumulative dividend means that holders of preferred stock must be paid their annual dividends plus any dividends and arrears. That means dividends from previous years that they did not receive before commons received their dividends.
So here's an example. Scientific leasing has 5,000 shares of 7%, $100 par value, cumulative preferred stock outstanding. The 7% is called the dividend rate. Each $100 share pays a $7 dividend. Why? Because 7% times 100 is $7. And then you multiply that by the number of shares, 5,000 shares times the dividend per share, so the annual dividend is $35,000. If dividends are two years in arrears, which means they haven't paid dividends in two years, preferred stockholders are entitled to receive the following dividends in the current year. First of all, they'd get their dividends in arrears, which is the 70,000, which is the 35,000 times two years in arrears, plus the current dividend of 35,000, they would get a total of 105,000 dividends before we gave a penny to the common stockholders. That's why they call it preferred stock. The other preference they have is liquidation preference. If the company goes under or they just decide to terminate the business, they get a preference. And the preference typically means that they'll get uh, um, paid before the common shareholders get paid. MBOT Corporation has 10,000 shares of 8%, $100 par value, cumulative preferred stock outstanding. No dividends were declared in 2012 or 13. If they pay, uh, want to pay 375,000 of dividends, common shareholders will receive. Well, first, Remember what we do, get the dividends and arrears. Okay, so we're going to take 10,000 times 8% times 100, and that's going to be $80,000. And so your 80,000 is your regular dividend rate. And you're going to pay the two years dividends and arrears plus the current dividend. So three years, which is $240,000. And that 240,000 will be paid before any of the um, common shareholders get anything. So take 375, subtract the 240, and that gives you 135,000, which is what the common shareholders will get. So remember what dividends are. A distribution of the stockholders on a pro rata, which means proportional ownership basis, which means if you own 10% of the stock, you'll get 10% of the dividends. We've been talking about cash dividends, but we also have different types of dividends, like property dividends, which are assets besides cash, stock dividends, which are additional shares of stock, or script dividends, which is basically a promise to pay. With cash dividends, you cannot pay them unless you have retained earnings. So you have to have a balance in your retained earnings. You obviously have to have enough cash to do it, and the board of directors declares it. So it becomes a legal liability to pay those if the board of directors declares them. And the dividend dates we talk about, the de declaration date is the date the board authorizes the dividends. The record date is who gets the dividend. Whoever owns the stock on that date gets the dividends. And then the payment date is when they actually write the check and, and pay the dividends. So let's look at this example. December 1st, the directors of Media General declare a 50 cents per share dividend on 100,000 shares of $10 par value common stock. Dividend is payable on January 20th to the stockholders of records on December 22nd. So since there are 50, 100,000 shares at 50 cents a share, that would be $50,000. So we're going to 
debit cash dividends, which is basically something that is part of retained earnings. And credit dividends payable. We owe them that on, on the declaration date, it becomes a legal liability. And so that is a liability account. The date of record, no entries made on that date, but the date of payment, we're going to actually pay or distribute the cash. So entries for cash dividends are required on what? Well, only the declaration date and the payment date because the date of record, we have no entry. Stock dividends is another type of dividends, except you don't pay cash, you pay additional shares of stock. And so um, a lot of people like to have that rather than a lot of companies because they don't have to spend cash. They have more shares of stock out there and a portion of the stock is reinvested in the business. The effect of the stock dividends, it changes the co composition of stockholders' equity because we're going to be reducing retained earnings and putting it into the paid in capital accounts, but the total stockholders' equity doesn't change. And the par value does not change. However, it does increase the number of shares. More shares are going to be issued. For example, Medlin Corporation declares a 10% stock dividend on its $10 par value common stock when 50,000 shares were outstanding. The market price is $15 per share. So the way this is set up, we have before dividend, what the dividend does, and then what's it look like after the dividends. So if you think about what we mean, there are 50,000 shares times 10% means that there, look way down the bottom here, are 5,000 new shares, 50,000 times 10%, 5,000 new shares. Okay, and the par value is $10, so this 50,000 change here is the 5,000 shares times the $10 par value but the market price was 15, meaning there's a $5 excess above the par value, and that times your 5,000 shares gives you the $25,000 plus over here. And so altogether, that's gonna mean that you have a $75,000 increase and your retained earnings because you pay a dividend is also going to go down go down by 75,000 so the net effect is zero and that's the whole reason we're talking about here the total stockholders equity doesn't change but the makeup of it does so after the dividend what happens is that again the total stockholders equity does not change but the makeup of it changes. Stock splits are similar to stock dividends, but not quite the same. What happens is, let's say that you have a two for one stock split. This would mean that you give me back your one share of stock and in its place, I will give you two shares. So you'll have twice as many shares. No entries needed for that because you're just giving more shares representing what you had before, which does what? It reduces the market value, it decreases the par value, and doubles the number of shares if it's a two for one, if it's three for one, it would triple it. So in assuming instead of issuing the 10% stock dividend, they split its 50,000 shares on a two for one basis, meaning give me the one share and I'll give you 
two shares in return. So it kind of summarizes it right here in that twice as many shares, which I'll circle that in yellow here. Now we'll have twice as many shares, but the par value goes in half. Now the difference between the effects of stock dividends and stock splits. The stock dividend decreases retained earnings, increases par value, uh, total par value, but there's no change in par value per share, increasing the shares outstanding. Stock split, there's no change in the retained earnings, no change in par value, there's a uh, total par value, par value per share decreases, number of shares increase. Which of these statements about stock dividends is true? Well, we know that stock dividends were actually going to reduce retained earnings and increase your paid in capital, but the total stockholders equity does not change. So we know that <clears throat> it has no effect on total stockholders equity. It does not reduce its cash balance, it has nothing to do with cash, and it doesn't decrease total stockholders' equity. It stays the same. And D, it, stock dividend ordinarily will increase total, total stockholders' equity. No, again, it stays the same. So it has no effect. Let's talk about retained earnings. Retained earnings is net income that the company retains or use in the business. It's the profits that they keep in the company rather than paying out in dividends. So net income increases retained earnings and a net loss decreases retained earnings. Retained earnings is part of the stockholders claim on the total assets because why? The retained earnings belongs to the owners. And a debit balance, which is possible, if you have a lot of losses, you could have a debit balance, and that's called a deficit or a retained deficit. And don't forget, dividends reduce retained earnings because they're paying out the profits. Here's an example from Amazon. And if you look on their uh, stockholders equity section, instead of retained earnings, they have a very big accumulated deficit because they had losses for so many years. And retained earnings can be restricted. And they can result from legal restrictions, contractual restrictions, or voluntary restrictions. It just means that the company can place a restriction so that dividends cannot be paid for for variety for these variety of reasons. So on the balance sheet, we talked about it before, we have two classifications, capital stock and additional paid in capital. And so we have the paid, here's the capital stock, here's additional paid in capital, here's retained earnings, and then we subtract out treasury stock. So it just gives you an example of what the uh, whole stockholders equity section looks like. Now, how do we use stockholders equity as part of our performance measurement? Well, one thing is called the payout ratio. And you see this formula right in the middle the payout ratio is cash dividends divided by net income. And here's some, here's some data up top here, dividends and net income. So if we just divide them, dividends divided by net income, and it's 26.7% in 2011, 27% in 2010. What is it? It's a measure, the percentage of earnings that a company distributes in the form of cash dividends. Another way of saying it is how much of net income does a corporation actually pay out or pay back 
to the stockholders. It belongs to the stockholders, but they're either going to pay it out or they're going to keep it. So if they have 27% paid out, where's the other 73% going? They're keeping it or retaining it. Another measure of performance is return on common stockholders equity. And that is sometimes just called return on equity. You'll see return on equity. Many times it just says ROE, return on equity. And it is net income minus preferred dividends divided by average stockholders equity. So we're gonna take the company's net income divided by their average stockholders equity and you'll see in this case 21.8% in 2011, 20.7%. This ratio shows how many dollars of net income a company earned for each dollar of stockholders equity. So for example 21.8% means for every dollar of stockholders equity invested by the investors, they'll get 21, almost 22 cents of earnings on that dollar. Well, when a company uh, is raising capital, they normally have two choices. They can borrow it, which we call debt or liabilities, or they can have the stockholders put it in by issuing stock, which we call equity. And there are lots of advance, advantages to debt financing or so-called bond financing is that it does not impact stockholder control. In other words, if you issue more stock, you have more stockholders, so your control is diluted. There is a tax saving result, and that's because interest is a deduction for taxes, but dividends are not considered an expense. And return on equity more than likely will be higher because you have fewer stockholders. So when you are looking at the debt versus equity decision, you want to look at two performance measurements that we've seen before, um, three, excuse, three performance measurements, return on equity, return on assets, and leverage, which is the debt to assets, how much they borrowed. So here's an example. Microsystems has 100,000 shares of common stock issued at $25 per share and no debt. Its plan is considering two alternatives for raising an additional $5 million. So they need $5 million to run the business. Plan A involves issuing 200,000 shares of common stock at $25 per share. Plan B in involves issuing 5 million of 12% bonds at face value. Income before interest and taxes will be a million and a half dollars and taxes are expected to be 30%. Okay, so income before interest and taxes, that was given, that's the same. Now interest, for plan A, there's no interest because they don't have any bonds, they've just issued stock. Plan B, they issue stock, and so you have interest of 600,000. So it looks like maybe the stock deal is better because look at the income before taxes. However, taxes, we have less taxes because you have less income when you issue the bonds. So the taxes are less for the bond and when you look at your net income, it still looks like, wow, maybe the stock plan is better. But if you measure it as a return to the stockholders, using that, um, what we said before, net income divided by common equity gives you your return on equity. So look what happens. My return on equity for the bonds is much better than return on equity for the stock plan. So even though the net income looks better by issuing stock, 
to the stop from the stockholders perspective they actually have a higher return why because there are fewer stockholders out there Finally, we're going to talk about entries for stock dividends. We talked about this example before. They declare a 10% stock dividend on 50,000 shares at $10 par value common stock when the fair value is $15. This is an example we saw earlier. But now we're going to record it. On the date of declaration, we're going to debit stock dividends, which again is really part of retained earnings and we're gonna credit common stock distributable, which is the $10 par value times the $5,000 shares, which is 50,000 times 10%, 5,000 shares. All right, 5,000 shares at $10 gives you 50,000. And then the additional $5 in excess goes to paid in capital in excess of par. And then when you actually distribute it, you're going to reduce that distributable amount and credit common stock. Let's talk about some of the differences with IFRS. Um, under IFRS, they use this term reserves quite a bit. Um, almost anything related to equity other than those coming from your contributed capital they're going to use reserves. So they're going to use reserves for retained earnings, asset revaluations, fair value differences, etc. Another interesting uh, thing about it is many countries have a different mix of investor groups than the United States. United States most investor groups are individuals, um, might have institutions, institutional investors like um, pension funds and such. But for example, in Germany, financial institutions like banks are not only major creditors, but they're often the largest corporate stockholders as well. And a lot of it is just terminology differences. This, this slide shows what we call it for US GAAP and we call for IFRS. So common stock, it's called share capital ordinary, stockholders, typically called shareholders, par value called nominal or face value, etc. So you can see some of the differences just in terminology. Under IFRS, a purchase of a company, of purchase by a company of its own shares is recorded by what? Well, we know in US GAAP, we have treasury stock, but under IFRS, they can call it treasury stock, uh, decrease in contributed capital, decrease in share capital, all are the same. Now in US, it's only treasury stock that we use. The term reserves is used by IFRS with reference to all the following except well, we said it's not used when it comes into uh, the uh, contributed capital, but you can use it in these other exam other instances. Under IFRS, the amount of capital to receive in excess of par would be credited to, I showed you on that one slide, we call it share premium ordinary. Uh, under US, what do we do with that? It's called paid in capital in excess of par. Well, that concludes our final chapter related to stockholders' equity. I'll see you in class, and good luck on your exams.